Okay. So <clears throat> um, this part of the reading was about skepticism. Um, right, the, I guess the title of part four of book one is Skeptical and Other Systems of Philosophy, something like that. I don't know. Anyway, um, so skepticism is the view that we must or ought to suspend judgment, not believe. Um, and Hume breaks it down into two parts. Um, so the first one is skepticism about reason. And the second is skepticism with regard to the senses. Now, um, Usually, in most years, I assign both of these. So this is um, part four, sec uh, section one, and this is part four, section two. Usually, in most years, I assign both of these. Um, uh, this year, because so usually I teach on Tuesday, Thursday, and this year I'm teaching on Monday, Wednesday. And because I'm teaching on Monday, Wednesday, there's a Monday holiday, so I have one less class. So I had to like consolidate, and this is where I did it. So so we actually didn't, this part wasn't assigned. And instead, uh, um, so in most years, the next class would have been sections three and four. But this year we're skip, skipping section three and just doing section four, which is the modern philosophy. Well, that was the reading for today. Um, um. And um, as in all skepticism, this is just the same thing I was just <laughs> talking about in the previous class. It's weird how that keeps happening. But um, as in all skepticism, the, the method, the road to a general uh, doubt or suspension of disbelief has to lie in the use of our opinions against each other. Right, we can't appeal to an external standard because then we would not, that external standard itself would be something we're not calling into question. So instead, the skeptical method is always to somehow produce arguments on both sides such that, oh. Our, or, or anyway, somehow to get our ordinary beliefs to undermine themselves. Um, and that is true both here and here. So um, I'll, I'll try to point out how it happens in the section on the senses. Um, And as for why I put this together with this, I mean, it's basically like, um, this, 
this is the clearest example of the of the type of philosophical view that he uh, criticizes at the end of the section two. And uh, not by coincidence, it's it's basically Locke, right? So, um, where am I? Um, so for both of those reasons, it's important to read this. The other section in between is basically about Aristotelian metaphysics, and it's interesting, but less, uh, both less clear continuation of what he's been talking about in section two and less relevant for the purposes of this course. Okay, so... Um, so Hume begins this section on the senses um, by claiming, so, I mean, I guess I should say, how does, how does this section about reason end up? I mean, uh, he basically tries to show that uh, um, all demonstrations are subject to some slight amount of doubt that we might have made an error in the demonstration and that, you know, because of that, uh, I mean, from that he develops the conclusion that um, uh, we actually have no reason at all to, to believe in the conclusion of a demonstration. <laughs> And then he tries to explain why we don't reach that conclusion. Because we definitely don't. <laughs> and obviously, like, even he hasn't reached that conclusion because in this very section, he's doing, he's giving all these arguments, right? So, uh, um, Uh, so his final conclusion is, um, you know, because of certain principle of the imagination or whatever, some principle of human nature, um, this what looks like a logical conclusion that would lead to this. <laughs> uh, hello. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. What looks like a logical conclusion. Uh, uh, that we it looks like a, a conclusion that we would have to accept um, turns out to be a conclusion that I don't know how to put this. What looks like a course of reasoning that would force us to reach a certain conclusion actually doesn't force us to reach that conclusion because, um, and it's roughly speaking because like the more complicated an argument is, the uh... <laughs> <It's> okay. <laughs> the more car the more complicated an argument is, the less effect it has on us. So as the argument gets more and more complicated, uh, it has less and less effect on us. And basically, the effect goes to zero before we get to the bad conclusion. So the so the argument is valid, but it just doesn't work for us we don't believe the conclusion <laughs> um so he begins the section on the senses by saying and here similarly with what i just did before i'm gonna um of course not end up concluding that we shouldn't believe in the existence of the object of the senses um uh you know Nature won't let us stop believing in that. So uh, obviously we have to have an implicit faith in our senses, as he puts it. But uh, but I just want to look into why. That's what he says at the beginning. In the end, it turns out that it's not so clear. So... Um,
This is um Oh, it's on the bottom, in your edition, it's on the bottom of page 266, on top of page 267. Um, having thus, having thus given an account of all the systems, both popular and philosophical, with regard to external existences, I cannot forbear giving vent to a certain sentiment, which arises upon reviewing those systems. I begun this subject... with premising that we ought to have an implicit faith in our senses and that this would be the conclusion I should draw from the whole of my reasoning. But to be ingenuous, <laughs> which is a really weird thing to say here anyway, but to be ingenuous, I feel myself at present of a quite contrary sentiment and am more inclined to repose no faith at all in my senses. So surprise. <laughs> um, uh, um, surprise, I told you that my conclusion was going to be that we, sh that we should believe in the object existence of the objects of our senses, um, and I was just going to explain why we believe it, but having come to the end, uh, I feel like uh, we shouldn't believe them. And then he says, Um, so this is the bottom of 267 and the top of 268 in your edition. This skeptical doubt, both with respect to reason and the senses, is a malady which can never be radically cured. Mm -hmm. So he says with respect to reason and the senses. But he didn't say anything like this about reason. Okay, that's weird. I just noticed that. Anyway, he says it's a malady which can never be radically cured, but must return upon us every moment, however we may ch chase it away, and sometimes may seem entirely free from it. Tis impossible upon any system to defend either our understanding or senses. Blah, blah, blah. Carelessness and inattention alone can afford us any remedy. For this reason, I rely entirely upon them and take it for granted that whatever may be the reader's opinion at this present moment, that an hour since, sorry, whatever may be the reader's opinion at this present moment, that an hour since he will be persuaded there is both an ex external and internal world, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so... Um, Um, so it actually turns out, I mean, it's weird because I was going to explain why this happens in this case and not in the reason case, but then he seems to say it does happen in the reason case. But I never see it happen in the reason case. In any case, what we'll see is like that by the end of this, he doesn't just show that you should suspend your belief about the existence of external objects. Um, he has arguments that see, right, which is all the, like the worst we got in the reason case is that you shouldn't be convinced by any demonstration of reason. You should suspend judgment. But here, in fact, he's he's going to end up with proofs that seem to show that it's certainly false that the objects of our senses exist the way we think they do. Um, that the vulgar um, uh, the vulgar way of believing in the objects of senses, that is the common, like vulgar just means common, right? So the vulgar that is common 
way of of believing the objects of his senses, which he says is what we all do, even philosophers, when they're not actually thinking about philosophy. <laughs> um, he says that way, at least, is not absurd, but nevertheless is certainly false, and you can convince yourself it's false very easily. And then the philosophical systems, which are supposed to correct that, are actually incoherent. They're absurd. <laughs> So, uh, um, so you can't just right away say, oh, but I believe it anyway. Um, you have to kind of wait to till you forget the conclusions of those proofs, and then you'll believe it again. <laughs> um, Okay, so that's the overall plot that we have coming up. Um, um, there's, there's already in that passage I read at the end of foretaste of what's going to happen in section seven, the end of book one, where uh, Hume has a much more like elaborate and dramatic statement of that that like when i get to the end of this i find that i'm i don't know what to think and you know uh etc um it's um i guess i'll talk more about <clears throat> how that how that works and what kind of fiction that involves when I when I get I talk about section seven. So for now I'm going to talk about the argument of section two. Right. So um and then about section four. Right. So um skepticism with regard to the senses means it means skepticism about the continued and distinct existence of the objects of the senses. That is the 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 view that we're doubting here that we're trying to call into doubt although again in the end it turns out to be worse it turns out like we show it's false <laughs> but the view that we're trying to call into doubt here is the view that um the things that i'm sensing now first of all that they continue to exist when i'm not sensing them Right, so I'm sensing the pen and I close my eyes, the pen still exists, at least sometimes. Of course, sometimes it doesn't exist. It's something happened while I close my eyes, but at least in general, they continue to exist, right? The fact that I'm not sensing them anymore doesn't make them stop existing. That's the continued existence and the distinct existence um, means that the uh, objects of my senses uh, don't depend on my mind for their existence. They don't depend on it and they're not in me. Um, but he mostly, I mean, that second version of it is a little bit mysterious. Um, um, they're not in my mind. Um, but maybe in the end they come to the same thing. I don't know. But in any case, they don't depend on my mind for their existence. That's the distinct existence, right? So, I mean, Hume says these two things go together. Right on the one hand, like uh, um, if they continue to exist even when I'm not sensing them, 
they must be distinct from my mind because they're not in my mind then and they still exist. <laughs> um, and um, on the other hand, um, if they don't depend on my mind for existence, then they there's no reason they should cease to exist when I stop sensing them. So they should have a continued existence. So he says that these two things go together. Um, but nevertheless, he discusses them separately. They don't they don't mean the same thing, even though they imply each other, basically. And um, and and that fact is going to be part of his explanation of how we get ourselves in trouble here. Um, I mean, roughly speaking, the explanation is going to be that something makes us believe in the continued existence. And we don't think about the fact that that requires the distinct existence. Um, but then we can, well, maybe that's how I should put it. Something makes us believe in the continued existence. And then, because that implies distinct existence, we start believing in the distinct existence. But the truth is that it's clear from experience that the objects of our senses don't have a distinct existence. And therefore, um, there we um, are turned back to denying that they have a continued existence. That's That's kind of the plot. Or rather, maybe I should go into a little bit more detail. Therefore, we should just deny that they have a continued existence. But instead, and this is the transition from the vulgar view to the philosophical view, instead we say, oh, no, no. Okay, the immediate objects of our senses, that is the ideas in Locke's sense, don't have a continued existence. They don't exist when I'm not sensing. But something else, that that immediate object that I perceive by way of them, that continues to exist, right? So we save the continued existence by putting it in a second object. Because we really, what we really wanted to believe when it was continued existence, basically. That's what we first got to. Then we said, okay, oh, continued, therefore distinct. Then we said, wait, they're not distinct. So they're not continued. But we really wanted to believe they're continued. So we invent this other place where they are continued, basically. That's uh, that's that's the plot. So what that means is though that like um uh for the vulgar view and the philosophical view, continued and distinct existence of the objects of our senses mean two different things. They don't mean the same, and it doesn't mean the same thing in the vulgar view as it does in the philosophical view. So, and again, right? I mean, this is important to, for like understanding what he was saying, vulgar just means common. It doesn't mean like rude or something, right? <laughs> um, uh, so the, the vulgar view, that is the ordinary common sense view is that objects of the senses are the same thing as our impressions. That is, the objects of the senses are the very beings that our mind perceives. So, I mean, first, the vulgar wouldn't describe it this way. Right? That is, we're thinking with the learned and speaking, or well, we're speaking with the learned and thinking with the vulgar, I guess. But anyway, like the vulgar wouldn't describe it this way. They wouldn't say, this pen is an impression, 
right? But um, but that's really what they think because they don't think that there's something else between them and the pen, between their mind and the pen. So like the very thing that's present in their mind, they think is the pen. So, um, so skepticism about this means doubting that our impressions can continue to exist when we're not perceiving them. So th that is what the vulgar believe. And now we can see that he partly agrees and partly disagrees with Barclay about what the common or vulgar um, opinion is, right? What common sense is. Barclay and Hume agree that it's um, not common sense to suppose that there's immediate object of perception beyond the immediate object. Right. So like when Barclay says, you know, um, I'm all, all I'm saying is the common sense thing that we are fed and clothed and whatever by the immediate objects of our senses. So, uh, you know, like what what clothes me is is the very thing that I see and feel and et cetera. Um, so Barclay and Hume agree that that's the common sense view. Um, but they disagree because Hume says, yes, that's the common sense view, but it's part of the common sense view that um, those very things that I perceive are still there even when I'm not perceiving them. So, of course, Barclay doesn't think that, right? Barclay thinks it's absurd that an idea could exist anywhere but in a mind. So, right, so like Barclay, um, like suppose I look at this pen and then I close my eyes and then I open my eyes again. So Barclay will say, there's an idea idea of a pen, then there's no idea of a pen, and then there's a new idea of a pen. This is the idea of a pen. All right. So, um, right, this is where my eyes were closed. This part, there's no idea of a pen. So, I mean, because Barclay says, number one, that, that this is the common sense view according to Barclay, because Barclay says, number one, uh, the common sense view is that the very thing that's, that's the object of my perception is the pen. And he says, obviously that thing doesn't exist when I'm not perceiving it. Its being is to be perceived. So when I'm not perceiving it, there is no such thing. And so this is really, a, this is a different thing. And then he has his work cut out for him trying to um, uh, like um, convince the common sense person that, uh, that this isn't a bizarre view. <laughs> Right, because the like the first thing they say is, "Wait, are you saying that the whole world is annihilated every time I close my eyes or whatever?" I, that's not that's not common sense, right? So, but Barclay thinks it has to be common sense because again, it's absurd. There's nowhere else that this idea could be. Whereas Hume thinks that common sense is that there's an idea of a pen. This is the idea of a pen. And this, this is my mind. And here the idea of the pen is in my mind. And here it's in my mind again. And in between it still exists, but it's not in my mind. 
So this obviously is more plausible as a common sense view. The question is like, Hume has to explain why this, it makes any sense to think that, and he does have an explanation as we'll see. Okay, so that's the vulgar view that we're trying to bring into power. Whereas the philosophical view is the view that there's a double existence. And this this really is just Locke's view, so it should be familiar, right? There's, you know, there's the idea, and then there's the external objects. And the external object continues to exist whether I'm perceiving it or not. It doesn't depend on my mind. Uh, so, I mean, so, so it's continuous and it's distinct. It doesn't depend on my mind, one because of the other. Um, but the idea, of course, only exists while I'm actually perceiving. And this idea, obviously, um, Locke uses the word idea for everything, but this is the this type of idea is what Hume would call an impression. And he doesn't really believe in this part, but never mind. <laughs> so um, um, there's a double object, there's a double existence. Um, and the immediate object is not continuous or distinct, but the immediate object is continuous and distinct. And I guess you have to add one other thing. There's some kind of resemblance between this external object and the impression. So although they're not the same thing, they resemble each other. At least in some respects. Um, so here questioning the exist the the um the continued and distinct existence of the object of the senses means questioning the existence of this external object. Whereas here it meant questioning the continued existence of my impressions themselves when I'm not in my mind. Um, now he's already dismissed as absurd. Um, a th what you might think is a third option and what you might think is the most coherent option. Um, so this is on page 239 in your edition. For as to the notion of external existence when taken for something specifically different from our perceptions, we have already shown its absurdity. Right, that is, um, if you think that the immediate object causes, or causes us to perceive the immediate object, but doesn't resemble it, then Hume says, I've already shown the absurdity of that. And um, that, base, that basically is Barclay's view, right? That Barclay's view is that there is an external object, but it doesn't resemble my ideas. It's a spirit. Um, so... Um, So, I mean, that's why the section on the modern philosophy focuses on Locke. Um, I mean, I guess you might ask, why doesn't it focus on Leibniz or Malebranche or something like that? I think, I think Hume thinks that they're 
just continuations of the ancient philosophy in some way. Um, but uh, but the, you know, Berkeley is is left out of the section on modern philosophy because Berkeley's view has already been ruled out. Okay. So in this section, in, in section two, skepticism with regard to the senses, Hume actually spends most of the time trying to explain how we get to the vulgar view. Where it comes from. Um, and in particular, his claim is that it's a conclusion we reach through a natural and unavoidable, um, but not rationally justifiable thought process. It's not even rational in the extended sense in which inferences from effect to cause are, extent, are rational. Um, it it goes beyond the mere effects of custom, which are, um, which although they're due to imagination and not reason, um, they're uh, they're part of what we normally think of as the role of reason in judgments of probability or whatever. Um, it goes beyond that. It's basically something that Locke would call mad, <laughs> and yet the conclusion is unavoidable. So, um, so he explains that first, then he explains why nevertheless this conclusion is certainly false, so that when you start to, so w whenever you don't pay attention, you're automatically led towards this conclusion. So this is what all of us believe most of the time. But if you stop to think about it, you'll see that it couldn't be true. And uh, um, um, and when I say, when you stop to think about it, you'll see that. It, so what does that mean? How what does the stopping and thinking involve and how does how do you see that? And so the answer is that I mean, this is a matter of fact that we're talking about here, right? Like, do these impressions this is not relations of ideas. Do these impressions in fact exist or not when I'm not perceiving them? Um so the regular way of deciding questions of matter of fact is um, by inferences from effect to cause. And what he says is that when you stop and apply the regular uh, canons of, of inferring based on cause and effect, you'll find that you're forced to deny this conclusion of the continued and distinct existence of our impressions. So this is where that skeptical, like using our opinions against each other comes in. Um, this, so he says this explicitly, this is on page 313 in your edition, I think. Could that be? Yes, yeah. Okay. 
Um, right. So this is section seven, right? So we haven't got to this yet. Although I feel like he said this somewhere, but this is clearer anyway. Um, So before he was talking about the principle of the imagination that leads us to certain beliefs. And he says, no wonder a principle so, so inconstant and fallacious should lead us into errors when implicitly followed as it must be in all its variations. Tis this principle which makes us reason from causes and effects, and tis the same principle which convinces us of the continued existence of external objects when absent from the senses. But though these two operations be equally natural and necessary in the human mind, yet in some circumstances they are directly contrary, nor is it possible for us to reason justly and regularly from causes and effects, and at the same time believe the continued existence of matter. So, um, you know, so when I said we're going to show that the, this vulgar belief is certainly false, you know, what that really means is we're going to show that it's inconsistent with our usual ways of our, of reasoning about cause and effect. Um, and uh, um, I guess in principle, therefore, we could give up on either one of them at that point. I think, despite what he says here in section, section seven, that the principle of reasoning from cause and effect is supposed to be stronger and more regular. So that when we actually think about this, what results is in our thinking that this is false and, and holding on to the principle of cause and effect as, a, as opposed to vice versa, right? Um, um, but, you know, what we can't do, although in some sense it's what we should do, and it's why this is a skeptical argument, is just say, um, okay, the different principles in my mind contradict each other, I should suspend judgment. Um, um, I'm not able to do that. Okay. Are there questions about that so far? I have, I'm going to go on to the actual argument, I think. Yeah. Right, so to do this, to explain this, Hume has to explain how the imagination and why the imagination can transfer, transfer force or vivacity, that is belief, from a present or remembered impression to the idea of something that we never perceive. Right, I mean, again, the vulgar view looks like this. I mean, uh, no, I'm going to switch from a pen to a table because it's easier to draw a table. So the vulgar view. So like this is what 
Locke might call um, the idea of a table or the sensation of a table, right? It's an idea, but it's an idea that's perceived by the senses. I mean, that is that it's perceived by the senses here, and then again, it's perceived by the senses here. So I'm looking at the table, and then I turn around, and I'm not looking at the table, and then I turn back around, and I'm looking at the table. So, right, and this is my mind. So the vulgar view, so Hume has to explain how the imagination um, can be led to infer from these things that it does perceive, can, can, that is how the imagination can transfer the force and vivacity of these impressions to a belief in that is to to an idea of this impression which is never in my mind. I mean, it's by definition, right? The, the part we're interested in here is always the part that's not in my mind. So that's what I'm trying to transfer the force and vivacity to. So how does this work? And like the explanation Hume gives is very complicated uh, and interesting. So it, so it starts with, um, It starts with the difference between the sensations we call external and the other, or the impressions we call sensations or external impressions, and the other impressions that we don't call sensations or that we call internal impressions. Um, right? So, like on the one hand, we have, um, we have, uh, the primary and secondary qualities. So shape, size, et cetera, but also color, smell, whatever, right? Like those are things that we think have a continued and distinct existence. Even when we're not seeing it, the color is there. Even when we're not smelling it, the smell is there. Even when the tree falls in the forest and there's no one to hear it, the sound is there, right? Um, um, whereas those other ones, the like, uh, which is like pains, pleasures, um, and passions, those are the three things that Hume usually lists. Um, uh, we don't believe have a continued and distinct existence, right? So, like, when, uh, I poke myself with a pin, I feel pain, but I don't think the pain is still there when I'm not being poked, like in the pin. Um, and what, what would be the analogy with passions? Well, I mean, we Kim just says we like, we don't think the anger is still there when we're not feeling it. Now, I mean, like maybe um, to some extent we now, now we do think that. Um, um, which I think Hume would be able to explain actually. Um, because to the extent that we do think that, it's because we, we actually think that um, like the passions we perceive can be best explained if we assume that they're, uh, they continue unconsciously even when we're not feeling them or something like that. So I think Hume would, I think Hume would predict that if you come to believe that, you might start to treat them more like the other case. But, um, but so Hume assumes we don't think that, right? So like Hume assumes that we think that uh, you know, pain is there when I'm feeling it, and otherwise it's not there, or that anger is there when I'm feeling it, and other words, otherwise it's otherwise it's nowhere. 
Um, and he says, why? What's the difference between these two? Well, um, to, to put it succinctly, the difference is, but I mean, not too succinctly, because so the difference is that those things that we think of as external impressions have a certain kind of regularity, but it's like a defective regularity. Um, so, um, So sometimes, a lot of times, um, these impressions are interrupted and they come back again exactly the same as they were before the interruption, right? Like I close, my, I see the pen, I close my eyes, I open my eyes again, the pen looks just the same as it did before. Um, but of course, other times the thing is changing and, you know, so, um, you know, I see the pen moving, I close my eyes, I open it, and now I see it over here. So uh, there, it's not constant, it's not exactly the same as it was before. Um, uh, but there is a certain kind of regularity. Um, what's the regularity? Well, it's like, in that case, it's something like, um, if my eyes were open the whole time, I would have seen the pen in this position and then this position and this position and this position and this position. So I have a lot of experience of sequences like this. Now I have another sequence where I see the pen in this position, this position, no pen, no pen, no pen, pen in this position, pen in this position. Now, I mean, that's why I say this regularity is defective, right? Because sometimes I see this, but other times I see this. Do people understand what these two pictures are supposed to be pictures of? I'm not sure if I've made that sufficiently clear. Yeah, the pen, right? Yeah, right. The pen at different times. Yeah. So, um, so like there isn't a perfect regularity. Aha, uh -huh. but we can make the regularity perfect if we assume that the pen was really in these positions too, even though I wasn't perceiving it. Right, so it's a defective regularity, but it can be filled in. <laughs> if I add the assumption that things exist even when I'm not perceiving them. <laughs> um, so, whereas Hume says that in the case of the passions, um, um, Like on the one hand, they're practically never constant. They keep changing. But, you know, I mean, that's not such a big difference. Um, and, and remember, I mean, remember, Hume thinks that there's always a principle by which our, our ideas follow each other, ideas and impressions. Well. Wow. That hold for impressions. I think it is supposed to hold for the passions, um, which, how is that connected to the fact that they're passions? So. I don't know. Anyway, um, there there definitely is plenty of regularity in how our passions uh, succeed each other. But Hume says that um, 
uh, that regularity doesn't have this defect. Right? Like if anger is always succeeded by hatred or something like that. You don't have to ever, like you can base that regularity on the hatred, anger and hatred that you actually feel. You don't have to assume that there's some anger that you're not feeling that's responsible for the hatred in this case. And again, I think like if you start to believe in subconscious drives and stuff like that, then you might start to think that's not true. And then sure enough, you'll start to believe that the anger is there, you know, even when you're not perceiving it. So like I said, that actually kind of tends to support Hume's case rather than uh, uh, be an objection. Um, but it is a little bit weird. I mean, passions have certain other things in common with each other. And I'm not sure if we're supposed to think it's that's just a coincidence. Hmm. Well, in any case, so this is this is a, a beginning of an explanation for why we start to assume that. The pen is there even when we don't see it. And remember, this is the vulgar view. So the pen is there even when we don't see it means that there's a pen impression. <laughs> what a philosopher would call a pen impression, but what the vulgar just call a pen. And it's really the same thing. It's the thing that we immediately perceive when we're, uh, when we say I'm perceiving a pen. And we're saying that that very thing uh, sometimes exists unperceived. So, um, so you might think that uh, this already provides a perfectly good explanation then for where the vulgar view comes from. Um, because isn't this just an example of the same kind of custom that results in our belief in cause and effect? Right? Like, we always see it go this way. And so, even though this time these were missing, they're associated with the others because they always come together. And so, out of habit, we come to believe in them. Right? So, that is um, the um, uh, these unseen, these pen impressions that I didn't get in this case are associated with the impressions that I did get. And association with a present impression uh, transfers force or vivaciousness to the idea. And that force or vivaciousness is belief, right? So because of this association with a present impression, I believe in the existence of that impression that I'm not perceiving. That's how you might think it works. Right, so like as Hume first kind of explains it that way. Um, this is on page 246 in your text. Oops, didn't manage to switch. I never have observed that this noise, right? He, he's talking about a case where the, as we would normally say, the door is behind him and he hears it opening, but he doesn't see it, right? I never have observed that this noise could proceed from anything but the motion of a door. Again, as we saw in Barclay um, and in Locke even, he's like, he's taking it for granted that the door is the visible door. <laughs> right? I mean, really should have said is like this door noise. I've I never have observed that this door noise could proceed from anything but the motion of a visible door. Um, but in this case, I hear the noise. 
I don't see the door, but because I never have observed that a noise could proceed except from the visible door, I believe in the visible door. Um, So if that were really what was going on, then the, this belief in the continued and distinct existence would just be an example of, um, of like the normal type of probable belief in matters of fact. Um, but Hume says, it's not that, because the conjunction that's supposed to form this habit has a lot of exceptions. In fact, it has exactly as many exceptions as we're trying to account for, <laughs> right? Like. It's not true that I never have observed uh, uh, that I never have observed that this noise proceeds except from the opening of a visible door. For example, this very case is one where I'm hearing the noise and I don't see the opening of the visible door. Well, so these are these are pictures of pens, not doors. But uh, I guess I should refer to the door pictures, right? We're saying like every time there's been a visible door. There's also been, or sorry, every time there's been an audible door, there's also been a visible door. And so now I have an audible door. And even though there is no visible door, I conclude I believe in the visible door. But the truth is that uh, it's not true that there's never been an audible door without a visible door. For example, right now there's an audible door without a visible door. And in fact, every time um, I'm required to believe in the continued existence of the door based on this principle is an exception to the rule. Right, so the, um, this regularity isn't really a regularity. Now, I mean, it's interesting to ask how this is different from the cause and effect case, and I'm not sure I can explain that as well as I should be able to. Except that, again, you have to remember that it's, not really an inference from that in like at least then the end what we're really usually inferring is uh um um a collateral effect and that's something that we haven't had yet but we expect so like, even when it's about the past, you know, uh, like, um, um, I formed the belief that Caesar crossed the Rubicon in such and such year. And now there, I expect that all the books I read in the future will agree about that or, you know, something like that, right? So that like that kind of regularity continues. Um, and it is, and it's, and it's basically like, um, as strong as the, the belief that I form. But in this case, um, that is, I expect, I expect to see, yeah, that's the way to put it. I expect to see those collateral effects in the future just as often as I've seen them in the past. So like just as often as I saw bread, bread, uh, uh, visible bread also nurturing uh, me in the past, I expect to see that come together just as often in the future. 
But here, what we're saying is that um, I believe the visible door is there more often than I've ever seen it a visible visible door to be there. Right, like suppose, you know, that um, half the times the door opened, I was facing the door and the other half I was facing away from the door. So the regularity is that half the time there's an audible door, there's a visible door. But what I want to conclude is 100% of the time when there's an audible door, there's a visible door. So I, what I want is, and um, again, this isn't right. I can't check this in the future because the thing I'm trying to conclude to is specifically the existence of the door when I when I don't the visible door when I don't see it, right? So I can never check whether the visible door is there when I don't see it. I mean, I can look, but now this is a case where I do see it. I haven't established whether it was there just before. <laughs> Right. So this this like somehow has to carry me beyond the regularity I've actually seen to a greater regularity. And that's the whole point of it, right? Like we're trying to oh wait, what happened? Is this frozen? Oh crap. Which board? I can hear you and everything. Yeah, but you don't see anything changing on the board, whereas I've been drawing things there. Um, in fact, this is a perfect example. All these things you, that didn't exist until just now when you saw them. <laughs> right. So, right. What I was what I was saying the whole time is that you know. There's a regularity which Hume expresses by saying, whenever there's has been an audible door, there's always been a visible door. But in fact, it's not true, right? Like for example, right now there's an audible door, no visible door. Right, because he's imagining himself sitting in his study and facing his desk and his window and whatever, and he hears the door opening but he's not facing it. So he doesn't see a door opening. And what I was just starting to, what I was just saying is, so, okay, suppose half the time that door opened, he was facing it and the other half, he wasn't facing it. So that would mean that half the time there was an audible door, there was a visible door. We want to conclude that every time there's an audible door, there's a visible door. And that's actually not going to work, right? This is like an, overgeneralization. Um, and so, like I said, Hume, I mean, Hume sets it up as if it was going to work, but then explains why it won't. Um, this is, uh, oops. This is page 248. Um, in your edition. It is not only impossible that any habit should ever be acquired otherwise than by the regular succession of these perceptions, but also that any habit should ever exceed that degree of regularity. Any degree, therefore, of regularity in our perceptions can never be a foundation for us to infer a greater degree of regularity in some objects which are not perceived. Since this presupposes a contradiction to wit, a habit acquired by what was never present to the mind. Um, so what's going on here? And Hume says, well, first of all, uh, the imagination tends to overshoot. That's his first explanation. Um, it tends to overshoot the actual regularity by a kind of inertia. Um, and he doesn't explain exactly how that works in this case, but I think by analogy to what he says 
in the case of mathematics, which he alludes to here, it's something like that we learn that we can increase the regularity by taking certain precautions, right? Just like we learn that we can make the loose standard of equality, like uh, conform more precisely to the strict standard by, uh, by correcting it in certain ways. So uh, like here, it's kind of like, if I pay more attention, if I maybe use instruments like a mirror, <laughs> right? So whenever I'm sitting at the desk, I, I put a mirror so I can always see the door, then the regularity increases. And the imagination kind of gets on that train and keeps going and says, oh, so if I took all precautions, the regularity would be perfect. Um, um, whereas, of course, that idea of taking all precautions doesn't really, doesn't make any sense, right? Like arranging to see everything from every point of view all the time or whatever, right? Um, so uh, so that's part of the explanation for the vulgar view. But Hume says, um, that's not, he thinks that's not sufficient to explain the strength and pervasiveness of this conclusion. Now, I mean, I'm not sure exactly, but that's all he says, right? He just says, I am afraid that this principle is too weak to account for the great edifice of, you know, whatever. Uh, he doesn't really explain why or how, you know, how you can tell that some principles are strong enough and others are not. <laughs> um, I guess just by experience, he thinks it doesn't, um, I don't know. In any case, he says, so there must be a further explanation for what makes this so strong. And um, um, and I mean, I guess this part of the explanation is is the really important part. I mean, the in the first one, we still weren't that far from what we might have thought was going on, right? I mean, it, it's it's even it's like on the brink of seeming reasonable. I mean, when we thought it was like regular inferences from cause and effect, it really maybe did seem reasonable. That, you know, um, um, why do we believe in the continued existence of things even when we're not perceiving them? So now have I gone out of focus? Wonderful. Which chord is that? Yes. I'm back. All right. Um, why do we believe in the continued existence of things even when we're not sensing them? Because by assuming that we can, you know, um, think of the world as more regular and fill in the regularities. Um, but he thinks that's not strong enough. And uh, then he brings in this other thing. So the other thing is our tendency to confuse relation with identity. Relation in general, and especially resemblance. So, um, okay, what is identity? So remember from Locke that there's a general problem about the supposed relation of identity, right? It's supposed to be a relationship between a thing and itself, but a relation has two terms. And here we only have one. <laughs> so what kind of relation is that? Um, and Hume says explicitly something which I attributed to Locke, and I think Locke also would agree with, namely that from a single object, 
we get the idea of unity, not the idea of identity. Identity somehow appears as the relation between two things that are the same, which sounds like a contradiction. So um, Locke's solution, remember, is that identity is a relationship between two different things, generally speaking. So like, for example, um, this is the time direction. Here we have a tiny oak sapling. And here we have a big oak tree. These are two different things, obviously. Right? They're not even the same size. <laughs> but um, we treat them as the same for certain purposes, basically. And so the relationship of identity is a relation between different things uh, at different times that we nevertheless regard as the same thing in some respect. And you know, because it's relative to that respect, you know, what is the what is identical to this is going to depend on like what your purposes are, right? So like, although this oak tree is the same oak tree as this sapling, it's not the same mass of matter as this sapling. And you know, similarly, although like if someone dies today, um, and someone is reborn on the day of the last judgment, or someone, I guess you should say, someone is born on the day of the last judgment. Those are different human beings. They're not the same human being, but they may be the same person. So, right, because as Locke explains, person is, is like not, person is not the same concept as you might say, although that's not Locke's term, as human being. Um, and the, um, so what makes for identity of persons is not the same as what makes for identity of human beings. So that's Locke's solution. Hume's solution is almost the opposite. <laughs> so, right, so here we have, in, in Locke's view, we have two things that are really different, but that we identify with each other. We treat as the same, and that's the solution of the, the paradox, right? Like, how can these two different things be, how, how can sameness be a relationship between two different things? And the answer is they're not really the same, they're really different, but we treat them as the same for certain purposes. Hume, well, maybe I should have left that up, but on the other hand, Hume's view is hard to draw next to anyone else's view of time because Hume's view is this. Um, as long as something doesn't change, there's only one of it. And so there's no difference in time between different, there's no difference of time in it, right? Or as he put it before, like, and he refers back to that here, the idea of time is acquired from succession. Right, the impression that the idea of time is based on is one state following another, change from one state to another. So as long, so he says that like, if you could really focus your entire mind on one perception, then um, no time would pass while you were focused on that perception. A perception, an unchanging, constant perception. And he says, even now when we have lots of perceptions, time doesn't strictly speaking appear to apply to the ones that are constant. So, um,
Right, like, so suppose I'm listening to, like, the bagpipes or something, and there's, like, a continuous drone, and suppose it's ex it's completely continuous, it does not change at all, so I, it's the exact same sound, and then meanwhile, other sounds are coming and going. So the way you should look at that, according to Hume, and this is why you can't draw it on this nice time-space axis or whatever, is that all those other sounds are all simultaneous with this one sound, even though they're not simultaneous with each other. Right? So this succession of sounds is the, is the kind of impression that's responsible for the idea of time. So this is a time sequence, right? Note number one, note number two, note number three, note number four, one occurring after the other. But meanwhile, this impression doesn't have any succession. And yet, this impression is at the same time as this, and the same time as this, and the same time as this, and the same time as this. So, right, so, so this shows that really, like, according to Hume, it's actually a mistake to, to think that there's... Um, um, that there's like a time that it is everywhere, and then that changes to a different time everywhere, and so on and so forth, right? So this whole picture, where we think that wherever we are in the world, right, this is this this direction is space, and this direction is time. We think wherever we are in the world, it's the same time, and then it changes everywhere in the world to the next time, like. That's just not true. These changed from one time to another, but this is all the same time. <laughs> okay, but then he says, by a fiction, by a fiction, we think of this as having different temporal parts. One that's simultaneous with this, one with this, one with this, one with this. And then we think these parts are all the same as each other. And that's why we don't notice them changing. But they really are each that one they're changing into the exact same thing. Right. So again, Hume says this is a fiction. Really, this only has one temporal part. But we think of it as having several. And the relation of identity is a fictitious relation between the fictitious parts of this thing. So like I said, it's almost the opposite of, of Locke's view. Locke said that we have things that, that identity is a relationship between things that are really different, but we're treating them as the same. Hume says identity is a relation between things that are really the same, so there's really only one thing. <laughs> but we're treating them as different due to this fiction. And therefore we also invent this relation of identity that holds between these supposed things, although there really are no such things. <laughs> okay, so far so good. <laughs> Probably not. All right, so now, Suppose I'm looking at something like a table, and then I close my eyes, and then I open my eyes again, and I see, for now, suppose this is an exactly resembling table. Um, so, um, And I mean, I've drawn it this way, like in time, but again, maybe that's a mistake because I, I'm assuming the tables are constant on both sides, right? So there's constant table impression, no table impression, while other, meanwhile, while other things are changing. And then constant table impression again. So now when I remember this, 
Because of this exact resemblance, my mind passes very easily from this one to this one. And I think, although he doesn't emphasize this, but I think like this really goes together with the defective regularity point in that even if this isn't an exact resemblance, there's still, there's some relation between them that makes it easy for my mind to pass from one to the other. Um, so that's almost exactly like remembering one constant table impression that, let, that, that was simultaneous with all of these, right? So it's basically, I guess I should, I should draw it this way. Right, each of these was simultaneous with this table impression. Each of these was simultaneous with this table impression. And these in between were not simultaneous with any table impression. But when I remember it, if I'm focusing on the table, I just go straight from this one to this one. And it's almost the same as remembering one that was simultaneous with everything. And right, because in here there's no transition. Here there's a really easy transition in my memory. And so Hume says, I start to confuse this situation with this situation. I start to believe that the table was constant. The, 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 that rather than the resemblance, we had identity there, and there was just one table in place. So, but hold on a second. No table impression was simultaneous with these. So how can I think that? And at first it seems like I can't, right? And Kim says that makes the mind uneasy, right? Because I have this really strong tendency to identify these. That is to think that there's just one constant impression here. But on the other hand, these seem to rule that out. Ah, but I realize I can resolve that by saying there was really just one constant table impression, but it just wasn't present to my mind in here, but it still existed. Right, and that's the belief of continuous existence of our impressions. That's where it comes from. Right? That solves the problem, like completely solves it. It doesn't just rush it under the rug or something. Now, it really is true that there was a constant impression. Um, now, I mean, there's two things to say about this. One is that Hume still has to explain, as 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 he says, has to explain why um, we not only pretend that there was a table that existed even when we don't perceive it, but that we believe that it existed. Right? That is, we have to explain how the uh, force and vivacity of these uh, impressions get transferred to this imaginary idea of a table, of a constant table. Um, but the other thing we he has to explain is um, um, why this isn't absurd, as Barclay thinks it is. Right? Barclay thinks this is absurd because there's no such thing as an impression existing when I don't perceive it. Again, its being is to be perceived, 
But Hume says, um, um, No, I mean, I mean uh, what does it mean for an idea to be part of my mind? Like, what about these here? Well, it means that it's in a certain relation to a whole heap of other ideas that I call my mind. And that relation can change. So, right, that is, um, it doesn't, like, I guess you could say, Hume is saying to Berkeley, we don't have any idea of inherence of an idea in a subject. All we have is that we there's certain relations between ideas. Um, the ones that are related to each other in the right way make up my mind. But there's no reason there can't be one that's not related to my to the others in that way, and then it's not part of my mind. And there's no reason one of them couldn't change from one to the other and back. So here, like, it looks like the relation that's going to make this part of my mind is simultaneous, simultaneity with one of my other impressions. I guess you say simultaneity or succession, right? Like, that's the way my different impressions are related to each other, whatever that means exactly. How do we represent that? Like, what does it mean how do, when we think that a certain impression is simultaneous with another or successive? So, I mean, Kant is going to say that that's what Hume failed to ask. <laughs> um, and... Uh, and like basically that's the way from this to, to the argument in the first analogy in the in Kant's critique of pure reasoning. But okay, leave that aside. So so Hume says, you know, Barclay, uh, this isn't absurd because there's no reason an idea can't sometimes be in relationship to my other ideas and other times not. Um However, although Hume doesn't think this is absurd, he does think it's certainly false. So how can we show it's false? So for example, he says, try this experiment, press one of your eyeballs with a finger. So here I am, I'm looking at this pen. I press one of my eyeballs with a finger. Now there's two pens. Um, how is this related to our usual reasonings based on cause and effect? Well, our usual reasoning based on cause and effect is, so these two pens are indistinguishable. And remember, the vulgar identify our impressions with the objects, right? So when I press my eyeball, there are two pens. <laughs> um, um, so, um, one of them was caused by something I did to myself. Um, that is, it was dependent on me. Right? It only existed so long as I was in the right state. Um, but Hume says, like, the regular reasoning from cause to effect is, is this. Like effects have like causes. These two pens are identical. Um, uh, 
I can't assume that one of them is dependent on me and was caused by my pressing the eyeball and the other one is independent of me. If one is dependent of me, they're both dependent on me. And that shows that um, the, the impressions don't have a distinct existence. And therefore it shows that they don't have a continuous existence. Okay. Um, I am out of time and I didn't get to discussing the modern philosophy. So maybe I'll discuss it a little bit at the beginning next time. Um, but I mean, again, like the, the basic move after this is that the philosopher says, oh, 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 so, okay. So the impressions don't have a continued existence. And Hume says the conclusion ought to be um, that the objects of our senses only exist when we're sensing them. <laughs> but this the push to believe in continuity is so strong that instead the philosophers react by inventing another object that is continuous, <laughs> even though they've determined that what we used to think of the objects of our senses is, is, isn't continuous. All right, so I will talk about that more next time, which will be uh, a week from today because Monday is a holiday. Okay. I'll see you then. Bye, Professor. Bye.